but to make other cancers that you can treat by targeting a tumor and then hoping that after sessions, eight or so period will be done with multiple myeloma that cannot because the cancerous cells attach themselves to everything, including the bone marrow. So, you have to be like on chemotherapy for life. And because I was traveling to Kenya, I had to suspend my chemotherapy. But they gave me some drug to help me and um, make sure that um, the cancer does not grow while I'm away. And um, you know, what happens is that the side effects of this drug and others is that I have terrible, sometimes terrible uh, cramps. Sometimes they are in the legs, sometimes in the neck, <laughs> other times in the ribs. And when they come to the ribs, sometimes it can get to a point where breathing is difficult. So when you saw me standing over there, I wasn't running away from Comrade Way. <laughs> and definitely my daughter had not done anything untoward, but I needed to stand up. And now Comrade Jerry is being kind enough to stay up here, but there's nothing much she can do. But you know, with that singing and the spirit here, the cramps are going down. <laughs> I have explained to Comrade um, Juki that I can only take so much and my body, I tire very, very easily. Those of you who know about cancer, it's a, it's a disease of fatigue, but multiple myeloma is worse because it eats the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, and um, right now my humanity is very, very compromised, highly compromised. That's why I had asked Comrade Juki whether they could bring in some masks here because I'm not allowed to be in a situation where I have more than a few people um, in the name of compromise in a very, very big way. But right now, just by hugging and so or holding people, it, it spreads easily. You know, somebody or something can just touch you, and then you hear I'm in Nairobi hospital. So if you see me, you know, sort of giving you a bump or wearing the mask or having this cleaned, really, I'm, I'm not being obnoxious. I hope you understand and forgive me. And um, you know, I, I wanted to share that with you. Um, so now, um, one thing worried me when I was right there. The phone went off, and I thought it was my phone. And although I had asked my daughter, Monty, can you hear me at the back sometimes? I said, okay, can you? Okay. But although I had asked um, my daughter, my friend, my comrade, Monty, to put off my phones, I thought, oh, maybe she didn't put one of them off. And it reminded me of a story by Archbishop Tutu. He had an immense sense of humor. And once he's the, he was in the middle of administering um, communion, holy communion, and his phone went off, and it was very embarrassing. To to hide his embarrassment, he told the congregation, "You know, I had to take that call because God was calling." <laughs> I thought, well, "His God calling out there, but it wasn't me. It was someone else's God out there." Um, and then I do want to begin by thanking the organizers of this event. It's really touching. I am so, so deeply touched. I cannot tell you how touched I am because of the spirit of love and the spirit of comradeship and genuineness that I hear in your words. And I just want you to know, the organizers of this event, that this kind of thing for a person who is battling a life illness, it's like you're adding a lease of life. So you can that. You can that. I'm not going to name people here because I literally am looking around and seeing friends, 
from the 60s, from the 70s, from comrades who were in the underground um, struggle movement um, with me for years, you know, people from the December 12th movement, Macarano, Jafke, Kaif, and so on. I'm hearing from many of you that um, I have been with for years in the struggle, like in the work with the union, comrade in Tonga, and so on. But if you will allow me, I will mention two people who have been very active and who have been so persuasive that when I try to say, please, let's leave this event alone, they just wouldn't. And I've never seen such obstinate people. And what you have done for this country, truly I mean it when I say you all should just. I'm seeing young people that I've seen in the struggle from days gone by, um, you know, Modoni, this young man, no longer young, who was in jail. A whole lot of people are saying, oh my goodness, they are still at it. So next time a friend of mine that I went to university with, and who asked me, Michelle, you mean you are still doing this thing? <laughs> so I said, what thing? He said, you should mellow. So I have not mellowed, and you are encouraging me not to mellow, because you are literally, as some of the speakers were saying, bringing up, you know, um, these moments of revival, rejuvenation, and empowerment to continue. But let me also acknowledge my comrade and daughter, Mumbiwa Mogo, she and her sister, I think if it were not for them, I don't think I would be around. And let me share with you another miracle. This cancer, um, multiple myeloma, you are lucky if from the moment of diagnosis, you live beyond five to seven years. You know how long I've been walking the earth for? 15 years. And the empowerment and so on from so many comrades. I, again, I don't want to name everyone except for those organizing the event because it would be unfair. But my comrade, Mombi, and her sister have just been those lights for me. So thank you. Thank you very much for this great honor. I have jotted down notes, but don't worry about this. I won't keep you here till seven. I want to thank you all of you, and especially the namers of this set of awards, for your insistence on scripting an alternative text against the attempt to either demonize or soil the names of those who were once called dissidents by the ruling regime in Kenya in the 1980s and 1990s. And I'm sure they have new names for you, activists. I, I don't know what the names are, but I just want to thank you for providing a counter text to this terror of words and this terror of external definition. And this is why naming ourselves is so important. I want to thank you for reviving the national ethos and the national psyche, so we remember, because it's so easy to erase the memory and to force people to forget. Thank you for resisting efforts by Kenya's reactionary clique of national leadership, whether in politics or mainstream academia or whatever, efforts to induce amnesia in the collective memory of our beloved country is of stirring trouble or whatever. Thank you so much for rescuing history and her story from manipulation. Thank you for not becoming participants in your silencing, my silencing, and the silencing especially of the masses. Thank you for this revival. Thank you for breaking the cycle of negation, the negation of her story and history, and crafting the negation of our people's negation. And here I'm referring to Césaire, the Martinican revolutionary writer and poet. And he said that the biggest task, the biggest mission that you and I have is to negate negation by our oppressors. 
In other words, to rename ourselves and do away with whatever uh, labels they gave us. This mission in naming ourselves is part of our liberation. It is a part of our dehumanization, talking of you know, human rights. It is a part of rebuilding a new world. Thank you, therefore, for insisting we remember. For memory must be a part of the DNA that makes us interventionists in our history, history, if we are to create development forward, if we are to emerge with redeeming collective, collective visions that remind us of where we have been, where we stand, and where we are headed. In this regard, those of us who are lovers of African origin know of the wisdom of the Sankofa symbol among the Akan people of Ghana. And as you know, um, Haile Gerima, the revolutionary Ethiopian filmmaker, has used the image and symbol of Sankofa in his film, you know, and uh, named Sankofa. And in this film, you never forget the image that Haile Gerima creates for us of this world that symbolizes Sankofa you know, flying in the air, being pushed by the wind and the stream of that wind, ever going forward. But you know what? In the bird's beak, the bird carries an egg, moving as the bird swims unstoppable into the future. You know, and that is the future that will be fertilized. So let's create those you know, futures. Because really, as somebody said, once we all get together collectively to do the work, even though imprisonment has become, political imprisonment has become less, if we were all to do it, do they have enough prisons to, to lock us in? What do we lose? I do. I know those of you who are in prison, with all due respect, you lost a lot. And I have so much love and admiration for you. But we should learn from your courage, and we should learn to do this. I'm saying all this to say that this award that I've been given belongs to a lot of other people, including many of you in the room here. My, one of my mentors and very good friend, Professor Chinua Chebe, was, was bedroom before he died. And he had a friend, a lady friend, who would call him and moan all the time and keep saying to me, why me, why me, why me? And one day, Chinua Chebe told me, you know what I asked her? Why not you? I mean, who do you want to have the problems you're having? If it's why me? So I really do want us to understand that collectively that why me never occurs. I do want us to understand collectively that, you know, um, for instance, in my case, I avoid asking why me? Why did I get cancer? I mean, why not me? I mean, other people have it, so why not me? And, and, but, but for this award I'm, that you have given me, I'm not going to ask why me. <laughs> One of you is looking at this <laughs> but, but really, um, you know, this is made of some cover. So I want you to know here, all of you who are here, and other freedom fighters in this country, including the ones that Jerry was talking about, including those young people who were locked up in prison during the Mai Moi regime, including those of you who continue to fight and struggle and insist on human justice. I want you to know, I look upon you as some coffer. You, you remind me of that image, you know, as you push, you know, um, whatever, I bought a ticket and got ready to come to receive my degree. And just before I came, I was told no, it was stopped. And I couldn't believe it. At this day, in this day in Kenya, oh, why would you do that? So I didn't come and I didn't get my degree, my honorary degree. 
by the Department of Literature to Kita two years ago, was it 2021, and gave me an honorary degree. I am grateful for it. I respect it. Um, a professor by the name of Michael Chege, I don't know whether you know him, wrote an article in the Star um, last year. When Kenyan newspapers who are informed of a major award that I have been given by African rights um, in London, even though they knew about the award, they refused to write a word about it. So Michael Chege talked about what um, former Justice Mutunga was telling us about, and wrote an article on prophets without honor in their own country. A prophet is but without honor in his country. We can see a prophetess, although I'm not one, I've never been a prophetess, but in any case, without honor. So I want you to know you have redeemed all that and the pain of it, and the embarrassment of it, for what, you know? So, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. You are reminding me today that there are Kenyans for whom I share a whole story and history, and that that matters. You are reminding me, comrades, that we are breaking negative silence. And in my mother's poem and other songs, I differentiate between negative silence and positive silence. Negative silence is imposed upon us. You know, but uh, positive silence is something we choose to retreat, to take a break, to regroup, to meditate, and so forth. So this moment of meditation and celebration to me is very, very positive, and we're breaking negative silences. Lastly, I want us to remember, and this has already been said, so I'm repeating, but since I have put it in my notes, I was reminding us not to forget those words by Professor John Beatty, who was my professor as an underground, an under, an underground. <laughs> graduate <laughs> student at Makerere University. To, to, to be fair to Professor Mitty, he taught just incredible things. And I think he's the one who really introduced me to origin and African indigenous systems of knowledge. But you all know his book, The Late Mitty, African Philosophy and Religions. Um, but Professor Mitty to also, to be fair, tortured me by teaching me Greek and Hebrew. And in Makere, in those days, those of us who are called classical scholars, Greek and Hebrew, we would use the little Greek that I have forgotten, that we had been taught, and Hebrew to walk around, you know, talking, angapi, and so on, with one another. And people would look upon us as, who are these creatures from Mars? And we thought it was so wonderful and great. But now, I don't remember that because I have forgotten <laughs> those languages, dead languages, with all due respect, but because I don't use them, they are dead. I remember the teaching in African philosophy and religion. We've been reminded of it. I am because you are, and since you are, therefore I am. Please let us not forget that, comrades. That if the other person is not well or doing well, there is no point in our doing well. This is not an individual thing. This is a national project we need to engage in. And I want to congratulate you for engaging in this. Among the Shona people, there is a greeting where you ask somebody, how are you, are you well? I have cited it to the extent that if they had patented it, I would really be taken to court. <laughs> Hopefully not to the Supreme Court. But they say, how are you, and the, the answer in Shishona, they say, Diripo kam kanamori po jenu. I I am there. I'm okay. If you two are okay, I am well. If you two are well, isn't that a beautiful?